the God who confronted the dragon of chaos, cut it into pieces, and made the world. And that idea has echoed down through the ages. It's an idea that human beings have never lost. Now, this idea is very interesting. So you see the castle in the background. Now, we already know what the castle stands for. The castle stands for order. And it's a multi-walled castle because everyone's protected by multiple walls. But those walls are constantly breached. Now, young people, especially modern young people, are often very cynical about the traditions that they inhabit. They're cynical about them because they see the fact that the world is theoretically devolving into some kind of environmental catastrophe. And they're cynical because there's still war and because there's still hunger. They're cynical because often the people who are teaching them the traditions don't seem to believe in them themselves. And it's very easy for young people to look at the traditions that were and to notice the breaks. But the truth of the matter is, is that throughout human history, tradition has always been anachronistic and out of date. And what you see in images of St. George and the dragon is that the dragons always breach the walls, which means that tradition is always under attack from chaos. Well, of course it is, because the future is different than the past. But that doesn't mean that the past should be abandoned, because if you abandon the past and you knock down all your walls, you fall into a pit of chaos. And that, classically speaking, is indistinguishably, indistinguishable from hell. And I can tell you that if you spend long enough in that state, you'll become bitter and cruel because that's what happens to people who suffer endlessly. St. George is a different kind of individual. When the walls come crumbling down, as they always do, he decides to go out and to confront the dragon. Now, dragons are very strange creatures, as you may have already noted. First of all, they don't exist. Second of all, they have very weird propensities. So, for example, they hoard gold, and they tend to trap virgins in their lair, which you will also admit is very strange behavior for a reptile. Now, the idea behind this is that it's a very, very complicated idea. It's all presented pictorially. The idea is that the thing that lurks underneath, if you look to the right of the picture, you can see that there's a cave. The cave goes way down into the ground, and way down into the ground is the terrifying place that's underneath everything. The dragon crawls out from time to time to threaten the structure of everything that's known. St. George comes out to confront the dragon voluntarily, overcomes it, and in this image, rescues the virgin that the dragon has been guarding. It's a very complicated story. It means that the things that terrify you contain things of value. That's also what the image of the gold that the dragon hoards represents. It means something else as well. It means that the individual man who's likely to go out and confront chaos when tradition is crumbling is more likely to find a mate. This is Jonah. Jonah had a very weird experience. He was swallowed by a whale. <laughs> That's a very strange whale, as you, as you might well note. It's a medieval whale, and of course medieval people didn't really know what whales were, and so they were guessing what a whale was. And so a whale for a medieval person would have been a big fish, it would have been a squid, it would have been some monstrous thing like a shark that lurks in the deep, because they, didn't have, they weren't able to seg segregate all those things out biologically. They're, their powers of collective observation weren't that good. So the whale for them was what lurks underneath in the darkness, right? And the idea with Jonah was that now and then what lurks underneath in the darkness rises up to swallow you. But if your attitude is proper, then you can come back out the other side changed. Now that's a story of redemption. So for example, imagine that you are or were in a bad relationship. And maybe you weren't that happy about it. But, you know, it was better than no relationship at all. And then the person that you were in a relationship betrayed you. And maybe they did that because you actually weren't that happy with the relationship anyways. Maybe they did that because you were a little bit naive. Or maybe they did that because you were a little bit too easy to get along with and as a consequence a little bit on the boring side. And so when they first leave you, it's a catastrophe because your world falls apart. But when your world falls apart, you're somewhere new it's possible to learn something new in that place. So you might learn, for example, that you should be a little sharper the next time that you go out with someone. Or you should be a little bit more careful about picking up on clues that your partner's bored with you. Or that maybe you should stop associating with lying psychopaths and your life would be a lot more positive. And stop thinking that you have the capacity to redeem somebody that is not after redemption in the least. And what that means now and then is that when you fall into the belly of a whale and you're swallowed up by something that lurks underneath, that you can come out the other side transformed. And that's actually how people learn. Every time you learn something, 
You learn because something you did didn't work. And that exposes you to the part of the world that you don't understand. Every time you're exposed to part of the world that you don't understand, you have the possibility of rebuilding the structures that you use to interpret the world. That's often why it's more important to notice that you're wrong than it is to prove that you're right. One of the things that you're supposed to learn in university is precisely that. It might be useful to listen to people that annoy you on the off chance that they know something that, if they tell you, you can use instead of dying. Talking to people who agree with what you say is like walking around in a desert. You already know everything that they say. The reason you're associating with them in that situation is so that they never say anything that challenges you because you're afraid that if you go outside of what you understand that you won't be able to tolerate the chaos. But it isn't the case. People have an unbelievable capacity to face and overcome things they don't understand. And not only that, that's essentially what gives life its meaning. The Buddhists say life is suffering. And you think, well, if that's the case, why bother with it? And people do ask that question, and they ask it in ways that result in their own destruction, and worse, in the destruction of others. So, for example, people who become particularly cruel, particularly in a genocidal manner, are more than willing to dispense with as many human beings as they can possibly train their sights on, because they're so disgusted by the nature of human limitation that they'd rather eradicate it. And lots of people become suicidal because they can't bear the conditions of their own existence. And suffering is real, and it's inescapable. So the question is, what do you do about it? You notice in your own life, and, and you can do this by watching your own life. And I often ask my clients to do this. Say, look, watch your life for a week. And pretend you don't know who you are, because you don't know who you are at all. What you understand most about yourself are the arbitrary presuppositions that you use to hem yourself in. And you act as if those presuppositions are true, so that the revelation of the full nature of your character won't terrify you. People hide in their own boxes, and it's not surprising, but it's not a good idea, because life is too hard to hide in a box. You can't manage it if you do that. If you watch yourself for a week, you'll see certain things. You'll see some of the time that you're resentful and annoyed. And those are times when you're either taking advantage of yourself or you're thinking improperly. Some of the time you'll be bored, in which case you're either undisciplined or you're probably pursuing something you don't want to pursue. And some of the time you'll actually be engaged in life. And the times that you're engaged in life, you won't notice that you're there. Right? The dis distinction between subject and object disappears when you're engaged in something that you find meaningful. The purpose of life, as far as I can tell from studying mythology and from studying psychology for decades, is to find a mode of being that's so meaningful that the fact that life is suffering is no longer relevant. Or maybe that it's even acceptable. And I would say as well that people know when they're doing that. You know when you're doing that in part because you're no longer resentful. You say, geez, I could do this forever. Right? There's a timelessness, timelessness that's associated with that state of being. From a mythological perspective, that's equivalent to brief habitation of the kingdom of God. That's the place where you are that's so meaningful that it enables you to bear the harsh preconditions of life without becoming resentful, bitter, or cruel. And there's nothing that you can pursue in your life that will be half as useful as that. Your nervous system, being an evolved structure, is evolved for a universe that is composed of the interaction between chaos and order. Those are the most fundamental constants that we know. They transcend the mere perception of objects. Everywhere you go is chaos and order. Traditional Chinese doctors go into people's houses to diagnose why it is that someone in that house is suffering. And they walk in and they think, there's too much order here. I've been in houses like that. That's a house where all the furniture is covered with plastic. That's a house where if you put a glass on a wooden table, the mistress of the house runs over with the coaster, slips it under immediately, and gives you a dirty look. That's a place where the children never play in the living room. That's a place where the lines in the carpet are vacuumed so precisely that they're actually parallel. That's a place where there's so much order that no one can survive because the person who runs the house is a tyrant. And that anyone who's sick in that house is sick because they're suffering from an excess of order. And then you can walk into a house that's completely different, and you can even see this in your own room if you want. Everything's in complete disarray. You can't even look at that place. You're sick the moment you cross the threshold. 